definitely heard it from him. Whenever you see the word wherefore, it's, where, it's there for wherefore a reason. And so it's referring you back. Referring you back. But we'll get to that in a minute. But the uh, verse 7 opens up with the word wherefore. In other words, it's kind of like it takes a break. Wherefore, in regards to what we just learned, so let's move on. <laughs> wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today ye will hear His voice. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. That's provoked, for the word provoked, for those of you that, just a long version of the word provoked. As in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works, 40 years. Now, that's kind of like a, a voice of God speaking here, okay? He's talking about the Israelites. Now, they provoked him. And they tempted him. And he took care of them. And yet, let's move on. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Remember, they never entered into the promised land, right? Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, well, it is called today, lest any of you become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Well, it is said, Today, if you will hear my, His voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, for some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. There was two. <laughs> but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Tonight, the name of the message, if you will, or the study, if you will, is battling unbelief. And in your study guide, the, the word wherefore in verse 7 refers to the text that tells us to apply what is said in the preceding verses, as I mentioned earlier. And there we were told that Christ was better than Moses in the same way that a son in a family is better than a servant in the family. A son is always better than a servant, right? I mean, you can have friends and, and then you have family. Amen. As the Son of God, Jesus had left His Father's house, of which Moses was only a servant, and had come to establish His own house or His own family. As believers, we are part of that family, holy brethren with a heavenly calling. We are the brethren. The author's point, if you want to say author, I, I say Paul. You can say whatever you want to. You can say Paul or you can say the author of uh, the book of Hebrews never identifies absolutely the author, but we can point to many different things about the book that refers us back to the Apostle Paul and the way that he wrote and different things about the book. So I'm going to say tonight that Paul, his point in setting forth these truths was to help those Jewish believers see that their spiritual needs were met in Christ alone, in Christ alone. They had no further need of the law of Moses, all those sacrifices and rituals, and the priesthood. Christ had saved them, had sanctified them, and He would satisfy them. Amen. Just as He would a does in our Christian life. <clears throat> but that was the problem. Would they believe that Christ was enough? Many times in our lives, we get saved, but we get out of sync with God, and we just wonder, is it enough? Is it enough? Do I need something more? Is there something that I'm missing? Is there, what, what's going on? Why can't I get this thing right? 
To make his point, the Apostle Paul quotes from Psalm 95, which takes us back to the events of Israel's 40-year wandering in the wilderness. Moses had led them out of Egypt through the desert to the borders of Canaan, and when they saw that the enemies were strong, they occupied the land, and that there were giants in the land, and that there was just all kinds of things, they were just, we were as grasshoppers. Now, that's not what Joshua said. That's not what Caleb said. But as we go back here in a moment to that text, you will see that they were overwhelmed by the mob. Don't ever say that the mob, just because the majority believes something, doesn't mean that it's correct. Matter of fact, many times, the majority just believes that way because everybody else believes that way. A lot of times, the minority is correct. Amen. As it was in the case of Joshua and Caleb. See, they had passed through the Red Sea. They had drank water from a rock. They had doubted God's ability to deliver them from the giants of Canaan. I mean, they had seen the great miracles of God. They had seen so many things, and yet a giant in the land stopped them. Because of their unbelief, God did not let them enter into, the Bible says, enter into his rest. What he's referring to is enter into that land of Canaan. Now, in Scripture, in typology, in the Old Testament, the Israelites entering into the land of Canaan, the promised land, is a picture of the Christian crossing over into the land of the Lord and going and leaving and going back and being with him in heaven. It's a picture. It's typology. So if they didn't enter into his rest because of doubt, it's, it's a picture of a sinner, a lost sinner, who doesn't believe and never goes over and doesn't get to go home to heaven. Amen. In verses 7 through 19, tell us how to battle that kind of unbelief, the kind that will keep us living in the wilderness. Many times we live in the wilderness. And so many times, and, and I'm not saying that everybody that lives in the wilderness is not saved. But why would you get saved, become a child of God, and never go over, never, never get fully rested, never, never really enter into that land of rest? Why would you not want to do that? Why would you not want the fullness of God? So many Christians just get part of God. They get saved and that's where they stop. They just end up right there and they don't do anything more with it and they don't grow and they don't become what God wants them to be and God doesn't, is not able to use them and give them the gifts that God wants to bestow upon them. And you miss out on so much. You know, when we all get to heaven one day, God's going to show us what we could have done, what we could have had, what He would have done for us had we done what we should and listened to Him and gone over into that land of rest and finally let Him have His way. And that's a picture of, again, in typology of the Christian being sanctified. Sanctification. Amen. All right, let's, that, that's, this is powerful Scripture tonight. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. We get right into the outline, amen. And there's some blanks on there for you. And that's just the uh, introduction, amen. Lord, we thank you <coughs> for the Bible. Now it shows us so many things. These people, they, they had you. They, man, they, they were slaves, and beaten and downtrodden, and got the freedom, and had you to. You were feeding them and you were protecting them and parted the Red Sea and you gave them water out of a rock and all the things that just showed yourself time after time after time like in our lives. You show, your, you show up in our lives time after time. And then something comes along and we're provoked by the devil, tempted by the devil. We quit. Lord, help He would not let us enter into your rest. 
because of your unbelief. First of all, number one on your outline tonight, the path of unbelief. These are progressive steps on the path of unbelief. Each worse than the one before. If a person persists through all three, the result will be a hardened heart. Jeremiah wrote, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It is not to be trusted. We are not to be guided by the feelings of the heart. That's why God gave us His Word. We are to be guided by the facts of His Word. First of all, if you look at verse 7, in verse 7 it says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, today, without delay. There's your word. Do not delay. Today. The devil loves to tell us, How about tomorrow? How about next week? How about next year? And the flesh says, it'll be easier if you wait a while. You don't need to do that right now. There is great danger in putting off until tomorrow what we know must be done today for, for God's will. Amen? God's will today. And again in verse 7, it says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear His voice. Today is a word of promise. It tells us that God is prepared to act on our behalf in response to our faith. He's ready to meet our need, overcome a problem, deliver from temptation. He's there for us every day. He's waiting for us to engage with Him. But we don't ask. And number three, today is a word of Urgency. Urgency. It reminds us that to delay often leads to disappointment and defeat. When God reveals truth, He expects us to act promptly. I'll never forget, as plain as my nose is on my face, I was down in Kentucky in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people in the wrong car doing the wrong things, and I was going 120 miles an hour down the road and in an old car, and the car started shaking, and the dude, the guy in the back said, you better get on down the road because them guys back at that place, they're awful thirsty for that beer. So I put the pedal down on 120 miles an hour, sure as shooting, the drive shaft fell out. Brother Steve, what does that mean? <laughs> That's bad, isn't it? That's bad, Steve, isn't it? Well, normally, they told me later, I didn't know, I was just some dumb kid. They said, you didn't flip? Your car didn't flip end over end? I said, I didn't even know it was gone. I said, we just started coasting. We had to walk back. A mile and a half to find the drive shaft. So the drive shaft, instead of going straight up into the rear and flipping the car, if there had been a car behind me, it would have been a rocket through its window. It went straight out the back like a rocket, started to raise the back, and then went straight out. The Lord was there. I knew within a shadow of a doubt. That was my final warning. I knew. Have you ever known that when you go through something and a trial in your life and you're doing wrong, and the Lord just says, okay, I spared you one more time, but that's it. You still want to go back to Egypt? <laughs> There's a whole other story that goes along with that, but the, but the bottom line was I knew. That was my final warning. Lying in the sand. Yeah. Grayson knows. <laughs> oh, she's not in here, is she? Oh. Well, I could say I could say more. All right. Just kidding. <clears throat> now, 
verse 7, look at it again. I mean, we're not done with verse 7 yet. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear His voice. The word that I want you to look at is if. If. So, the devil plants doubts in your heart. Doubts in your mind. Hey, you can't do that. You're not able to do that. You don't have the time. You don't have the effort. You don't have the money. There's no way you can do that. You've got children at home. You've got a wife. You've got things you've got to do. And this just ain't going to happen. Hmm. To tempt, in verse 9, means to question the character of or trustworthiness of. Look at verse 9. When your fathers tempted me. Consider the things that God had already done. Remember the plagues? Anybody remember that? Anybody ever watch the Ten Commandments? I know they did. I think Frank watched it last week. He told me he was going to watch it. It's a good movie to watch. I mean, the old one. The original. Charlton Heston is Moses. Amen. The plagues, the sea, the manna, the water, the cloud. And the cl- remember that? The cloud by day. Fire by night. Amen. How, no wonder, no wonder God was mad at him. When he come back, oh, there's giant, oh, oh, there's giants in the land that were just like grasshoppers that we can't even. Idiot. After what they had seen God do, but isn't that how it is in our lives? We see Him work over and over and over and over and do great mighty things in our lives and we forget. And then something comes along and just takes a hold of us and we forgot all about what He did before and we're, got, we're focused on what's going on right now and we say, it just can't be done. Is that right? Somebody say amen. On the outline, the next word is, it is not a sin to have doubts. It is not a sin to have doubts. Listen to me. Everybody has doubts. It's when you act upon them. Doubt tells us we need faith as big as a mountain to move a mustard seed. Amen? That's right. Doubts need to be examined by the Word of God and not the other way around. Then go back to verse 7 again. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye, if, there was the last word, ye will hear. Well, they heard, but they disobeyed. Disobedience. Disobedience is your word there. To hear God's word means that we need to receive it and respond in the proper manner. Oh, so often we come to church. We sit under the preaching of the Word of God and we hear the preacher gets up, he's worked hard, he's studied. It doesn't matter if it's me, if it's Ezra, if it's Brother Charlie, if it's Brother Charles, or if it's Brother whoever, Brother Brother, and the other brother, and his brother. It doesn't matter. Whoever's in this pulpit and you're hearing them and they're telling you the truth and you go home and you go right back and do the, exactly the opposite of what you just heard. What did it matter that you even come to church for? I'm just asking. I'm not making fun of anybody or nothing like that. I'm just telling you it's in the Bible. Go back to Numbers chapter 13, amen? Numbers chapter 13. And, and you know, I don't, I don't want you to just think I'm just making all this up. These people died. Listen to me. These people died in the wilderness for their sins. That's how we'll die. We might be saved and, sa- and going to heaven and all that. People just died dissatisfied, disobedient, and disgruntled, and just a mess. Have you ever met somebody like that? Look at 13, verse, chapter 13, verse 30. This is, the, this is one of the good guys. By the way, <laughs> I love that story. One of my all-time favorite stories in the Bible, when Caleb got his mountain. 
You God gave him a whole mountain. You want a mountain, Mark? Wouldn't it be alright to have your own mountain? You know that God wants to give you a mountain tonight? You know that God wants to give you a mountain tonight? But He can't give us the mountain that we're supposed to have because we don't claim it. Caleb couldn't even tell him about it. He said, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses said, let's go up at once. Let's go get it. Let's go take it. It's ours. It's always ours for the taking. God already promised it to us. What's wrong with you people? Hey, listen, you better get right with God here. Amen. And we're, oh, we're well able to overcome it. <laughs> but the man, I think this was the deacon board, but the man that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people. They are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land when they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up all the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Enoch, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we're in our their sight. And all the congregation lifted up, and they all cried and went to bed and cried all night. All the children of Israel murmured against Moses, against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? Why did you bring us here? What is wrong with you? Don't you, re don't you remember how good we had it back in Egypt? I don't know about you, but I never had it good when I was in sin. I don't know about you, but my life was a mess. When I didn't have God with me, when I wasn't getting right with God, everything I did turned to mud. Everything I did just turned to mush. I got in deeper in trouble. I was deeper in debt. I had nothing to my name. And the more I tried, the harder it got. And the deeper I got. And the more I drink, the worse it got. And the next puff I took, the way it felt good for about two hours. Until I sobered up. And I was broker than I was before I took the puff. Sad thing. Disobedience of the Lord. Look at verse 5. Uh, at verse 4. And they all said to one another, Let us make a captain. Let us return unto Egypt. We refuse to hear God. You know what happens? We listen to the wrong voice. Right there on your paper. Wrong voice. Voice. They listened to the spies. There was two spies. It was all right. Satan has little voices that he puts in our path that he allows us to hear. Look how much easier it's going to be if you take this path Look how, how much one more wonderful and nice and pleasant it's going to be if you don't serve the Lord. Look how much sleep you're going to have. You can sleep all day and rest and watch the Super Bowl and you don't even have to come to church today. It wasn't worth watching anyway. It was a Super Bowl. <laughs> I, saw, I saw a great uh, post on Facebook. It said the original Super Sunday. There's a picture of the tomb with an empty stone. Empty, the stone rolled away. The original Super Sunday. <laughs> I mean, that's it. <laughs> I said, I got to share that. Woo! I had all kind of people got on. Hey, amen, amen, amen. They ever want to watch that game and stay at home from church, though. Amen. I know they did. Wrong voice. We are easily deceived. Next word, easily deceived. There was an evil report. The Bible warns us, what does it say? The wiles of the devil. 
an evil report. Hmm. You know, our only defense against that is the Bible and prayer. The next word you see is our judgment no longer becomes trustworthy. It's a downward spiral down. It's a it go it just keeps getting worse and worse. We will return to Egypt. And they're going to open us they're going to welcome us with open arms. What universe did you come from? You don't remember the whips? The mud? The poverty? No food? But when we're doing wrong, we forget. We forget where we came from. We forget that. The devil says, look at how good that was. I don't want to go back. I don't ever want to go back. I don't ever want to see that again. I love my life. I love serving the Lord. I love coming to church. I think it's the greatest job in the whole wide world that you pay me a little bit of money to study the Word of God. I'm telling you what, there is nothing more exciting to me than I sit down in my little office all by myself. I get up early, put a hot cup of coffee on the, on the table there, sit there, turn on all my computers and get all my books open. And me and the Lord, man, we just start yelling and hooting and having a good time in the Lord. Hey, listen, it doesn't get any sweeter than that. Man, why do we forget? We forget how good it was. It is. And then finally, the last thing that happens is, the last word is we forfeit God's best for our lives. What did God say? Go back to our text. Verse 11, he got mad. You don't think God don't get mad at you? Woe unto you. God is mad at you. Somebody said one time, I was hearing a preacher and he said, hey, if you're out of the will of God and you're going to go get, get on a jet airplane, please let me know because I don't want to get on that jet airplane with you because God might shoot that airplane out of the sky just to, to get even with you and take me with you. Hello? You don't think that stuff happens? You don't think he can do that? You don't think he he can take a child because you're messing around and messing around and messing around? He could take a child. He'll get our he'd get our attention, wouldn't he? That always scared me to death. I scared me to death as a parent growing up. Lord, Lord, please don't allow me to get out of line. Please don't take my children. Don't kill my children. I'm telling you. I've seen it I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. It's so sad. I don't know. I don't know what I don't know what happened. I don't still know what happened. There are, I knew what happened. Of course I prayed with him and had compassion and did all I could, but there was a reason. It's a reason for everything. Do you believe Romans 8, 28 tonight or not? Just say yes or no. Do we really? But see, we say we do, but then we live our lives and we act like we don't. Because he is the one that's in control of everything. And he can make your life nice <laughs> or not so nice. He... he God doesn't sin. God doesn't lie. God doesn't do that. But what he does do, here's what he does. Yeah. No, he takes his hand and pulls it off. That's all he's got to do. And the devil comes in there, see? And the devil gets his way. You know what he said to, remember what he said to Job? You can do anything you want to, but don't kill him. Anything you want. Anything you want. What if he said that about you? Anything you want. Do anything you want to Brian, but don't kill him. Would that be horrible or what? Have you read the book of Job? 
You know, it is so hard to read that book. I have read through that book. I tried to read through that book when I was in the hospital at Cleveland Clinic. And it made me so depressed, I was even more depressed. After I read the book of Job, I had to put it down. I thought, my Lord, I'm not even close to this guy. And I feel terrible. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get some relief here, Lord. I couldn't read it. I had to read something real squishy and nice and, you know, that God is love, you know, like the Joel Osteen kind of messages. I had to go, I had to go back to that easy stuff, amen? I'm just being honest. Listen to me. This is life. Wake up. We forfeit God's best for our lives. We continue in our wanderings. Our heart is never satisfied. We experience want because God is limited in what He can do. We suffer our, our, for our willfulness, our rejection of God's Word. We continually err in our hearts and establish a delay, doubt, disobedience. We look for someone or something. You know what? Oh, oh guess what? You know what we do? This is, you see this a lot, people that are messed up. Have you ever seen this? Everybody else's fault. You ever seen that? You ever seen somebody? They mess up all the time, and it's every. Why did you do that? So we have a thing in our marriage. Anything that happens in the house, it doesn't matter what it is or what was done. It's Teresa's fault. So when so, so, something bad will happen, she'll go. I suppose this is my fault. I suppose this is my fault again. It must be a husband-wife thing. <laughs> okay, now we're going to end this on a good note in our text. Number number two, uh, the uh, second, uh, number two, three priorities of the faithful. Number one, in verse 12, to take heed, brethren, take heed, have caution. Exercise caution. Take heed. Don't get infected with a heart of unbelief. And this, by the way, this warning is directed at the brethren. Hello? Remember? He's telling the Jews not to be Jews, to be Christians. The book of Hebrews was written to tell the Hebrews not to be Hebrews, to be Christians. That's right. Exercise caution. Christian who follows the pattern of unbelief will eventually depart from the living God. Eventually, if you stay away from God long enough, you're gonna, it's just going to stop. It just Listen, coming to church three times a week, reading our Bible, praying like we should, doing the right thing, making right choices, it takes work. How many things? Was it hard to come to church tonight? Raise your hand. Amen. Everybody should raise their hand. You know what? I wanted to stay home tonight. Somebody say something. <laughs> Dustin told me that his mother's preacher looked at the weather report and canceled church at 8 o'clock this morning. I, I thought, well, that might be a good idea. I'll have to go check that out. No, just kidding. Exercise caution, number two. The issue is not losing salvation here. The next word, losing salvation. Not about fall, it's not about falling into immorality or gross sin. It's about abandoning God. It starts with just the little things. Abandoning God. Don't come to church. Skip church a while. Uh, don't read your Bible a while. Just do what you want to. And you know, and you're not, does that make you a terrible, awful uh, you're a murderer and you, uh, you're going to go to prison. No, you're still a good person. Still the brethren. But what happens is you're more susceptible to the things of the world. And the things of the world come by and then now you're not grounded. You're not hanging out with Christian people. You're not around. You're not hearing the preaching of the Word of God. Oh, I remember what that preacher said. How can you if you weren't there? Number two. Exercise caution, number one. Number two, encourage others. Verse 13, exhort one another daily. Amen. I hope you don't get mad at me for saying this. 
you two on the front row. I was coming over your house this morning. I was so worried about you guys. I haven't seen you in church for a little while. I, I was I was headed over to your house this morning. I really was. You know why? Not because I was going to yell at you. Because I love you. I miss and I missed you. And I love your kids. They're precious, and they look good. I'm telling you, we love having them in church. We do. We miss them. My wife, she goes and she creates a lesson. I'm just going to tell you this. She creates a lesson all the time. She says, oh, if those little kids are there, I'm going to be ready. She wants to be ready. She's always ready to go out there and teach a lesson. She's got, she, she goes in there. Her little, she's, by the way, she has her own little office too. She, she has her little pastor's wife office. She goes in there and works, and she has all kind of Christian literature and all kind of coloring books. and Man, she has it all, and she can teach from kindergarten to, don't tell her I said all that. Ninth grade, because she used to teach fifth and sixth grade. Uh, Haley, where's Haley tonight? She's working probably. She used to teach Haley for years. Uh, Haley would tell her, well, I, I, I don't want any other teacher. I just want you. I'm not bragging on truth. I'm just telling you. The only reason I'm telling you that is because we love you. I'm not picking on you. Please don't get mad at me. Okay. I want to tell you that I, I was coming out tomorrow. You were on my list, it was, uh, Mark and Jessica. You were, you're, I got it wrote down in the office. Honest to God. Encourage others. You don't see somebody here, what's the last time you, you cared enough to call them or well, knock on their door? When's the last time? I mean, there's people that come to church and we don't see them again. And, and, they'll, and you know what, people, here's what they do. And it's okay, it's my job. I, I, love, I don't care to visit people. I say, Pastor, where's so-and-so? How come we haven't seen him? I'm thinking, you call them? But I don't say that. I don't say that. I say, you know, uh, I will call them. That's what I say. I'll call them. I'll, I'll check on that. That's what I do. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's what, that's what God called me to do. But if we all do it together, encourage one another. Am I telling you the right? Am I telling it right, Brian? You want to come up here and finish this? <laughs> Why do we encourage others? You know what? You, you know what happens when, you, let me tell you this, when you go out and encourage others, you get blessed. You get blessed. I remember we used to go out and on visitation. We get so blessed. We, we'd be weeping and crying and yelling and running around my truck. I mean, having a, a I mean, just having a, a, I don't know, we had church. <laughs> Down on, down on the, I don't even know the names of them streets. Now I, I hear, I hear them on the news there once in a while. Somebody got shot and killed down there. That was my bus route. Oh yeah, Charlie knows. Yeah, mm, that's where my bus route was. Yeah, he gave me the best places. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so encourage others because of what it will do for them. That's your word there, them, and because of what it will do for you. That's your next word, because of what it will do for you. Look at verse 13. It says, but exhort one another daily. Well, it was called today. There's going to come a day when you can't exhort anybody. You can't. We're laying on the hospital bed and dying or, or sick or something's going on, and you can't do it anymore. Miss Lang tells me that all the time. I go over there. She said, oh, I used to love to go visiting, Pastor. I sure wish I could go. Just have to sit here and pray for all you now. But I'm praying for you guys. Don't, don't, I'm praying for you. She said, but I, I'd love to go, but I just can't go. It just breaks my heart. Amen. One day you're not going to be able to anymore. And then verse 14. We are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Endure in your first faith. Endure in your first faith. How did you begin? Now, I know I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or nothing like that. Do you know how this was when you got saved? And you were a new creature. A lot of us, we cried and wept and cried and wept. Not, all, not everybody. 
But you knew. I mean, you were happy, man. You were new. I mean, you knew you got saved. You knew. You were a new creature, man. You knew you were happy. Somewhere along the way. How is it that we lose that? Sad, isn't it? But it's that simple faith. Last word, simple faith. That allows us to be partakers of Christ every day. Partaking of Christ is compared to being in the rest, R-E-S-T rest, of Canaan. In other words, going over. They didn't get any rest in the wilderness. They were always moving. They were, they were pe- now Think about this now. Forty years. Now, how long is forty years? Forty years is a long time. We don't think about this really, but forty years is a long time. And they were only moving in a little small area. How could they keep moving in the same area and keep getting lost and never make it over? Because God confused them. You just don't. You can go all the way over to here, but don't go over there. You can go over to here, but don't go over there. Can you imagine? And they just kept moving and kept moving, packing up, moving and packing up, moving and packing up for forty years. How many of you have ever met somebody that's really old, but they, they love the Lord, but they, they messed up their life for 30 or 40 years? They've been wandering for a, lot, for a long time, and it looked like they've been wandering. That's why. They've been wandering in the woods for 40 years, and they look like it. They're all wore out. They need to go over. And they never did. I'll tell you the most miserable people you'll ever meet. Somebody that's called to preach. Saved and called to preach. Never, ever does it. They're the most miserable, God-awful people you'll ever meet. Some of them is in our church. Got to do what he asks us to do when he asks us to do it. Amen. Not more, not some more convenient day. Isn't that the old song we used to sing? Some more convenient day. That that famous uh, line in one of those old "I Surrender All" hymns. I think. Oh, we're going to have some more convenient day. There is no day. Is the day. Salvation. Tomorrow, you get to go over. Read about Joshua. Read about Caleb. Read about when they parked there on that Jordan River. And they parked there, by the way, three days and three nights. Did you know that? Did you ever study that out? You know that they parked there three days and three nights. Kind of what that's the picture of. And then they went over. You know the formula with the rocks and the priests and the whole thing. You preach that. I preached it before. And they went over. I wonder what that felt like. I wonder what that felt like for Joshua and Caleb. And only two and all their families. And all their listen, when we mess up, not only do we take down ourselves, we take down the people around us people that we love, all the people, our friends. I mean, everybody that cares for you, you take them all out. Messes them all up. Maybe we don't realize that either. All right. Did you all get all the answers? I have a sheet, sheet, sheet if you did not. Jim. Okay, others are hurt by our disobedience. That was what I just ended up with. I think I I skipped over that and went back to that. Others are hurt by our disobedience. We forfeit God's best for our lives. Anything else? 
Yes, ma'am. Number two, C, endure in your first faith. I probably missed that one. Yeah, that's probably my fault. Oops. Where are we at? Two, A, C. Oh, it's about abandoning God. There you go. Yeah. One person who can satisfy our heart. These are great outlines, folks. Great outlines. Anything else? Everybody got it? Got it, Brother Charles? If you don't, you can come up and have this. If you'd like to have this, you can have it. No problem. Amen. I'm here for you. Let's come and pray. Amen. Pray for the services this Sunday that God will bring out some people. Amen. As we continue to finish our building, we'll get ready to fire up the RU. Uh, Don't forget, a week from tonight. Now, tonight was a really bad, hopefully next Wednesday night, the weather won't be as bad, but you never know in February. If, well, I don't even want to say if. Just come. And it's for first choir practice next Wednesday night, okay? First choir practice. Brother Charles is going to fire up the choir, okay? Right after the service. Right after the service. And, yeah, and we can use teenagers. We can use anybody that wants to sing. Anybody that wants to sing can sing. Amen. I mean, Landon and all the kids used to come up and sing with us, right? Matthew, all of them. They can all come. I don't care. This is a Baptist church, man. This is a family church. You've got to make it family friendly. Was he praying? I'm sorry, Fred. Okay, we're ready to pray. All right. Fred, I'm sorry. Let's pray. Come on, let's pray.